The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Welcome. You know, before I begin this message, I, I want to share a little bit about the kind of time that we're living in. And it's like we're living in a season of walking a tightrope, uh, of being informed, misinformed, uninformed. <laughs> and in that kind of a climate where uh, there's not a lot of truth, or there's a lot of argument, there's a lot of deception. Uh, it's a, important that if ever there were a time for believers to draw closer to God and get his report on things because uh, the negativity in the atmosphere and the anger and all that, it, it will distract you from hearing clearly the voice of God. And so uh, titling this message, uh, Spiritual Connections. And I think even before we begin, we need to understand uh, at least how God works and how the devil works. You know, we're supposed to be aware of his devices. I don't like to spend a lot of time on the enemy, uh, but at least being aware of how he operates so that even today uh, we, we can see uh, some opportunity for you to navigate more effectively in an adverse climate. You know, uh, we, were, we were told of this in the scripture, you know, that you're going to shine like a light in the midst of a perverse generation. Well, this is our opportunity to shine bright, even in the midst of uh, dark and misinformation and uh, that type of thing. Uh, I want to start, uh, too, with a, with a story that was very meaningful. This week I had a phone call, and during that phone call, I actually got the message of how important spiritual connections are to us and there's greater and there's lesser knittings and we'll talk about that but uh, I also remember a time when uh, a pastor friend of mine uh, her husband was in Africa I believe he was with Heidi Baker's ministry doing some kind of a missions thing in Africa and she missed her husband and just like uh, we teach the five functions of the human spirit uh, she was releasing loving intercession to him even though she was by herself, he was by himself. Matter of fact, he was in a strange environment, new environment, and she missed him. And so she said, I'm just going to release love in the spirit to him. Because there's no distance in a time when there's a lot of isolation going on. All the time people are getting separated, uh, physically separated from other people, friends, family, um, church family, what have you. And uh, she would release love. And when they discovered the time change, he said, right at such and such a time, I could just feel uh, prayers or the love of God just saturating me. And it was exactly at the same time that she had set apart a time to pray and intercede in his behalf. And so uh, distance is a deception. The kingdom of God is within you. And cultivating that. You know, the scripture says they that are joined to the Lord are one spirit with him. Well, we need to cultivate that relationship and, and keep that spiritual connection. So the word of the Lord for today is spiritual connection, but also in a very practical way, we're going to take opportunity to pray for loved ones, pray for people that are separate, pray for people that are not around, uh, that you wish they were around. And uh, that, you know, that doesn't uh, mean that this Times of distance or isolation can't be a time of loving in the spirit, a time to where you can transcend distance and be productive. Loving intercession, God is love, his whole character and nature is love. Uh, we're to be his children and walk in that kind of love. Now, Hebrews 4.12 is a scripture that's used to tell you how the word of God works. So if you're joined to the Lord, you're one spirit with him, uh, it's, it's incumbent upon us to know how he operates. And you know the Word of God is a person. We, we see that in Hebrews 4, 
verse 12, the word of God is quick and powerful. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It divides asunder. It separates out for the purpose of clarification so that you can choose rightly, make good choices, choose the connection that would please God, not the flesh, but the spirit, and maintain that connection. And he puts it back together for his purposes. Yes, yeah, right. He puts you back together again. When, when the Word of God uh, discerns you, and that is still the primary way for you to cultivate your relationship, is let the Word of God discern you. This is one of the primary ways He's going to speak to us. He's going to speak to us through His Word, and when He does, let it separate flesh from spirit. Let Him discern you. Open your heart. like You're going in for open heart surgery every morning. Morning by morning, He's going to awaken your ear to hear and bring you into open heart surgery. Now, here's what He does. He, by His Word, will discern you and your condition. And, you know, every day is different. So, morning by morning, He's going to awaken your ear to hear what He'd have to say. And that Word then separates and what does it separate for? It's, it, well, first, the revelation is, here's what I'm saying, because it's coming from his word. So revelation is for illumination. Okay, so you, you can't say, I'm in the dark, I'm in the dark. When you're in the dark, you go to his word. His word is a light unto your feet, all right? So you go to his word for light or revelation or insight, illumination. Secondly, he separates, and he says, in light of this truth, don't do this. This is flesh. Choose spirit. So his purpose of coming like a sword and saying this is flesh and this is spirit is so that you would choose wisely. It's for the purpose of clarification. I can remember that was the word that came to me that I couldn't explain in the spirit. When I first got saved, all of a sudden it's like there's this whole new realm of knowledge, spiritual knowledge that was opened. It went beyond the reasoning mind. It was revelation knowledge. And when he opened up the words, all I knew is I kept saying, I've got clarity. I've got clarity. And there's some of you out there right now, you need clarity because you're being tossed to and fro by the winds of circumstances and voices, the voice of the world, the voice of the flesh, uh, you know, uh, things that are trying to distract you. And misinformation and uh, everything that could possibly distract you in a person, place, or thing, it's attempting to do so. And this is the time when we s sit still. This is the time when you don't race or run for, for answers. Now, again, God's plan. This is simple. Revelation is for illumination. You want to see His His. his revealing word to you, the proceeding word of God coming to you morning by morning. So the revelation is for illumination. He separates it out for what? Clarification. If, you, if you're confused, God is not the author of that. You need clarification. Separation is for clarification, but when he separates, what does he do? He say, this is God, this is flesh. He then allows you to choose spirit and the spirit connection over flesh connection. And in choosing so, you can now cooperate. And the grace of God is there and, and abounds and overflows. And the grace of God is his personal presence empowering you to do and to be all that he called you to do, all that he called you to be. And that unification is for the purpose of cooperation or he's putting you back together so that you function properly. Don't you want to function properly? <laughs> I sure do. And if God created me for a relationship, he also created me to be a partaker of that love nature, but to function properly and fulfill the purposes of God for my generation. Now, Satan's way is close. And like I said, we're not going to spend a lot of time on him, but we do need to clarify uh, his devices. And he, he's not, he doesn't create anything. He's an imitator. He's a counterfeit. And he will find a substitute thing. But you know what? In times of difficulty, we can be led astray by a substitute that looks like God, but it's not. So let's, let's be aware of his device. Here's Satan's way. You get a revelation, and that revelation, rather than getting illumination, 
He gets you into the reasoning mind and you're going to figure it out. You're going to overthink it. And this is part and parcel for a lot of Christians where they go wrong. They get a legitimate word that comes from God and then they decide in their reasoning mind to question, to doubt, to overthink, toss to and fro. Revelation for interpretation is exactly what Satan wants Christians to do. That's his best tool against a Christian, is get them to interpret. Get them into their reasoning mind and think they're smart and that they can figure out the answer. What does Satan do in the garden? It's the oldest trick in the book. Did God really say? Get you to question what God said instead of just obeying what God said, whether you understand everything or not, and wait for his illumination to show you that you, you fulfill that, that truth and fruit will evolve. But before the fruit manifests, you're a, you're a candidate for distraction. And the enemy uses revelation to get you to interpret. Uh, too often I notice the, even people with dream interpretation do whatever. A lot of times they haven't dealt with the fear in their heart and they're interpreting the dream. Well, you're coming from the wrong foundation. You're not coming from the source. You didn't let God look at you and show you, but you got fear in your heart. Any interpretation that comes through fear is going to be the wrong kingdom. It's not illumination. It's not clarification. It's, it's a distraction. And so Satan wants you to get revelation for interpretation rather than God's way of illumination. He wants you to get the reasoning mind, question, doubt, whatever. Then he wants to separate, listen to me believers, listen to me because this is this perfect season to fall prey to this. There's, uh, with the COVID and uh, isolation, uh, forced isolation in many cases, uh, this is the perfect time and opportunity that God would love, that the enemy would love to get you isolated. Isolation is God's way is, I want to separate something out so that you can get clarity. The enemy wants to separate you out to get confused, lonely, disheartened. Isolation for the purpose of him bringing you together in discontent and disconnect from the spirit. Keep in mind that when, when the enemy isolates you, I've even had people that I got a bad witness on when they said, well, you know, uh, I think I just got to get alone and pray. I just need to isolate myself from other people and church included and, and small groups or whatever else you have. I'm a suspect of that, getting alone to pray. Get alone to pray, but you don't have to isolate yourself in the process. You should be in a safe zone to where you can get alone and pray and have enough spiritual connections with people that you can bounce stuff off. Most would rather hide in isolation, and when you hide in isolation, in that darkness, those little critters will get into that mind and start telling you all kinds of weird things. We used to call it, when we traveled, we would see people that did that. We used to call it, they got the stupids. <laughs> Someone that was biblically sound, and, and, and all of a sudden, if they got off track, they would start talking stupid. They'd be in the sexual sin, or, uh, but it started with just isolating yourself from sound judgment, from any kind of wisdom. Um, so there's a disconnect. Satan's way is to disconnect. Now, the funny thing is, is remember, he's a counterfeiter. So we say God's way is revelation for illumination. God's way is separation for clarification, clarity, and unification so that you can cooperate. Satan's way is close. He wants revelation for you to interpret it in your flesh. He wants to separate you out and isolate you so that nobody can contradict it. Even people have said, Pastor, what do you think about this decision that I've already made? <laughs> you know what? There was a period of isolation that preceded that statement. You don't really want someone else's opinion. You want what you want and you did it anyway and then ask an opinion. That's not legitimate. That's after the fact. That's hiding. You are isolating. You are not allowing the word to expose any of the darkness or deception or mistrust in you. So, 
Satan's way is revelation for interpretation to get you in the mind, separation for isolation so he can disconnect you from spiritual connections. Say that with me, spiritual connections. That's what the whole title of this message is. Learn from it. Learn the how-tos. Learn that you need spiritual connections that are, that are clean, healthy, and holy. God place the solitarian families for just such a thing, for just such a purpose. He isn't going to leave you as an orphan. He places the solitarian families. It's your responsibility to be able to know where those greater knittings are. Satan's way is to unify for the purpose of confrontation. Uh, I always use the example of a lynch mob. A lynch mob, oh, they're, they're cooperating. <laughs> But the motive of the, is murder in the heart and fear. You'll see a lot of voices, and just because there's a majority doesn't make them right, does it? And not only that, but it will be a troop of frightened, angry people. And the accuser of the brethren, which we're actually seeing right now a great deal of in the church, it's like instead of praying and blessing, it's like too much, too much accusing of the brethren. Right now is the time to not fall trapped to that unifying. See, that's unification for confrontation. God didn't call you to get with every naysayer and lift up your voice and confront uh, people in the body of Christ. This is not your job. You are not called to that. Okay? So... That's, there's, your, there's your serious warning of spiritual devices. But let's, let's look at the anatomy uh, of spiritual connections. Let's look at how it was designed. Let's look at the fact that you are a new creation. I don't care what's going on in the natural realm right now. You need to know in the spiritual realm who you are, what you are called to do, and, and what God is, is, is working in you. And the truth is that relationship is the very core of the entire biblical revelation concerning God and man. That's kind of like a simple overstatement, maybe. But let's face it, that's what it is. The core of your biblical revelation is concerning God and man. God the greater made a covenant with the lesser. And that's you and I. And what a privilege that is, that the God of love would love us that much. And... The, probably the first statement uh, that is mentioned in Genesis 1, verse 26. Let us make man in our image. The first statement of God concerning man that he created was, let us, let us make him in model God's life, model God's character. But God, that man images, is a God of eternal, infinite relationship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Isn't that beautiful? We, we, we worship one God with a plurality, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and they are the epitome of unity. They're the epitome of a cooperation that God has longed for in his body of Christ. He even says that that is going to be the most powerful witness in the age to come, that the most powerful witness is that the world's going to believe because of your love one toward another. They're going to see that spiritual connection is something they couldn't fabricate. I can remember hearing testimonies of people going, intelligent people have a hard time with Christianity because it's, beyond, it's foolishness to them. And that's what the scripture says. It will be foolishness because there's a whole realm of illumination that opens up. And they'll make statements like, oh, I've heard over the years statements like, it's like you people know something that I don't know. <laughs> it, because it, it's an affront to, to their proud intellect. It it's, attacks their intellect and saying, I, they either know something that I don't know. Or like I had a policeman came, uh, his wife and children were all gloriously saved, filled with the Spirit. And he came to the service and he goes, listen to me preach one message. And he said, this guy is either the best con artist I've ever run into, or, or he really believes that stuff. <laughs> you know, That's the kind of impression we should be making on the world. Confuse the enemy instead of you letting the enemy confuse you. So uh, the, the word of warning right now, though, uh, that uh, I wasn't even going to get into that, but isolation. Be careful of isolation because the things that go on in isolation, 
uh, very often are the tool, the devil's tool, to get you off track. So no one's going to get off track. We're going to pray for you before, before this message is done. So the first statement that God makes is that he created man and he's going to make him in his image. And the second statement in Genesis chapter 2 is, it is not good for man to be alone. So, on the one hand, I'm going to make him in my image. But then, in the image of God, God is a creator God who longs for relationship. He's a covenant-making God. And he, he needs that relationship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He needs that relationship with us. Yeah, God has a need. He has a need to express that love that he is on an object. And you're that object. What a glorious opportunity to be receiving from him freely. So he says, Genesis 2.18, it's not good that man should live alone. And in Ecclesiastes, we all know this, Ecclesiastes 4, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone. There's a woe in there that you should write down. Woe to him who is alone. When he falls, there's no one to help him. And again, and then you're left to your own resources. So you'll just come up with some ridiculous conclusion. That's what we saw when people were hurting. When we were traveling church to church in those days, and we saw people hurting, we'd see that if they were alone, they came up with ridiculous conclusions. They got the spiritual stupids. <laughs> and woe to him who is alone. For when he falls, he has no one to help him. If two lie down together, they can stay warm. Uh, and how can two be warm alone? You know, when I see that word warm too, I'm not just talking physical warmth. I'm seeing the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Any other comfort's a false comfort. But I am, I am, says the Lord, the comforter in Isaiah 51. Uh, I am, I am the comforter. And I alone am true comfort. Everything else is a false comfort. So God's created us in his image, and it's not good that we would be alone. That's one of the key principles for biblical revelation concerning God and man, that we are spiritually connected. The second point is that the Bible talks about life and death as far as relationship goes. As far as a spiritual connection, your connection is either going to produce life or your spiritual connection is going to produce death. To be in a relationship with God, the source of life is to really be alive. To be spiritually connected to God is actually to be really alive. We're talking spiritual truth now. We're not talking about physical life or death. We're talking about life with a capital uh, L. Uh, the sozo kind of life. The God kind of life. The life that saves you from the world and live eternally. And this is eternal life, that you know Him. And so God's saying to be separated from God, the source of life, is to be dead. You know, it doesn't get much clearer. It's life or death. To be joined to God is life. To be separated from God is death. Uh, a person may walk around, laugh, eat, sleep, and still be dead. Isn't that true? We need to pray for the people that are like that because they need Jesus. They can, they can do and accomplish things. They can make a name for themselves. They can do all these things. But lost is lost. And spiritual death is spiritual death. A person who walks around that's dead needs the righteousness because righteousness is the root. It's a relational term. When we ter use the word in church, righteousness, righteousness, keep in mind that what it's saying is I am rightly related. I am spiritually connected properly. I am in right relationship. That means your spiritual connection. You can't live in unrighteousness and be religious. That's spiritual disconnect. Oh, it might have an appearance of good, but just being religious isn't sufficient. You need to be rightly related to the God who wants a relationship with you. And the fear of the Lord is not merely awe or dread. 
uh, every now and then you run into Christians. That's the only way they understand the fear of the Lord is this awe and dread. Uh, but the quality of the relationship, the fear of the Lord means, and just the way God taught me in the school of the Spirit, the fear of the Lord was, um, t teach me to honor Him. Honor is, is the fear of the Lord. It's talking about a relationship. The anatomy of a relationship is a proper spiritual connection to where the fear of the Lord is a desire to keep His commandments, a reciprocating of love that He put in your heart to please Him. Internal satisfaction of a relationship of receiving love will, will uh, catapult a want to reciprocate. If it's real in you, if the love of God is real in you, the want to reciprocate will be an automatic response. It's mutual. And God's basically saying that this is why the fear of the Lord is called the beginning of wisdom. <laughs> why is it the beginning of wisdom? Because it's the beginning of revealing to you how to live this life on planet Earth. How to live full and abundant. How to live in righteousness is being rightly related. Spiritual connections, I think, uh, at this point in time, are you're going to see a line drawn. You're going to see people in the valley of decision. You're not only going to see people coming to the Lord in purity, but you're going to see people uh, drifting away. It's almost like a separation. It's almost like at the table of the Lord on the night that Jesus was betrayed. Uh, it said that the disciples, it was a table of communion and thanksgiving and looking forward to the future. But it was in that communion, in that union, it said uh, Judas went out and it was dark. He had left the table and it was a table for him of separation. It was a table of isolation. He went and had a different idea. And it's, it's, I thought the picture language always intrigued me, that Judas went out and it was dark. The rest of them went to the Mount of Olives, known as the place of illumination. You see God's way and Satan's way? Satan wants to uh, isolate he wants you to interpret with some reasoning mind to where he can fill your heart with his own plan and his own agenda, which is a lie and a substitute, or take you to the place of illumination, revelation for illumination. That's God's way. And he took them at the, after the table of the Lord, he took them to the Mount of Olives, the place of further illumination. You know, it's a relationship that God wants to make us in his image, that there would be this back and forth relationship, that we would not be alone, we would be spiritually connected, and that it would be a matter of life and death, that it's not just a, a, a good and bad, it's life or death. It's not just a tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it's evil or life. Psalm 111 verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We're going to start praying. People start uh, recognizing their need for spiritual connection. I know uh, a lot of people have a certain amount of pride of being uh, a loner. And I've yet to see the fruit from that in anybody's life. Uh, it's kind of sad because they go church to church, but nobody believes like I believe. So I leave this church, I leave that church. Perhaps there's an adjustment in your theology. Did you ever think of that? Because that happens. Uh, and here's the th another point in understanding spiritual connections. God not only created us for, in His image for a relationship with us, the greater with the lesser, it is not only a matter of life and death, but thirdly, and I just love this truth, I've preached this before, because it really impacted me. And it cuts through excuse. I like anything that cuts through excuses. This cuts through excuses. We relate to God in the same way we relate to people. Oh, I love that. Boy, doesn't that cut through. That ex that'll expose some Pharisees. Huh? Remember those Pharisees? 
Abraham is our father. He said, your father is the devil because you do the works of him. He was a liar and a murderer from the beginning and you want to kill me. Duh. <laughs> what kind of religion you got if you want to kill me? And that includes murdering with the lips. It's too much, even on Facebook, there's too much slander going on. Christians, wise up. It might momentarily make you feel like you got a little release slandering, but it's not accomplishing anything for you. It's not doing you any good. This murder in its, in its initial form. We relate to God in the same way we relate to other people. Problems relating to God affect our relationship with one another. Isn't that true? If you see you're having a problem in your relationship with God, you will have that same problem with people. If you see that you're having a problem with people, you have that same problem with God. We relate to God the way we relate to people. We relate to people the way we relate to God. There's some people that this entire message, you only needed that to facilitate a quality change in your life. Look at your relationship to God, and if you think it's glorious and wonderful and your relationship with people stinks, you are in deception. How can you say you love God and hate your brother? That's, that would be the extreme version. But it's subtle. It can be very subtle. The two need to be synonymous. Problems relating to God affect our relationship with one another. Problems in our relationship with one another affect our relationship with God. But we know we love God because we love the brethren. Isn't that what the scripture says? 1 John 4, 12. There's your answer. 1 John 4, 12 says, We love one another. God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. Isn't that beautiful? 1 John 5, 2. We love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. There you go. You stay spiritually connected. All right. So what makes a, 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 a relationship? What makes a spiritual connection? Now we have a book, uh, Soul Ties, that, and when people hear soul ties they think of a sexual relationship, unclean sexual relationship. Soul tie can be an attachment to any person, place, or thing. You can have an addiction to something that in and of itself is not bad. You could have a soul tie with education. You could have a soul tie with life on the beach. You could have a soul tie with all different things. It's something to where it has you. You don't have it. It has you. So what makes a real good spiritual connection? First of all, you need to understand, we, we use the term that sometimes it's not real clear, uh, greater and lesser connections, greater and lesser knittings. Um, you can be, and you know, God places a solitary in families, but he also places you on a, the exact time and the exact place in which you should live. So he's not, he's not confused by the people you work with. And you see people come and go in the church. You see people come and go on your job. He's not confused by that. If you would see and entertain them with a proper heart attitude as angels, you could be entertaining an angel. And there's some people that are going to rub you the wrong way, but it's only to let you see what's in you. God's saying, I'm putting that slow person, Dennis, in front of you on the road to let you see what's in your heart. <laughs> okay? It's, it's God's kingdom. And life is a microcosm of that kingdom. And God will use it to expose what's in your heart. So there's casual relationships. Yes, you know, church membership can be sometimes quite casual. Club memberships can be very casual. You just become part of a club. Political parties, acquaintances, colleagues at work, doctors, dentists, uh, shopkeepers, customers. You can be a regular customer somewhere and there's a, a, a casual relationship. But then there's deeper relationship. There's relationships of, like marriage and family and close friends and small groups. And those spiritual connections have even greater power because they are, when one can chase, when the scripture says one can chase a thousand to ten thousand, there's a uh, multiplication, there's an exponential factor that says God is so pleased. Oh, 
His prayer for us in John 17 was that we would be one. Oh, when two or more are gathered in my midst. So it's not even the numbers or the quantity, but any remnant in various sizes of greater knitting has greater power and greater authority in this earth. Right now, I'm praying for our church and uh, our leadership within the church for health and healing to their physical bodies and to their families. And I think that's, if we would come into agreement on that, and, you know, uh, sometimes I'm in the middle of driving in traffic when uh, we like to pray like the early church did, 9, 1, and 5. Uh, my little alarm goes off, and sometimes I don't get much out other than I'll shut out. But I acknowledge at 9, 1, and 5 that the rest of our body is praying, or somebody in that body is remembering to pray at 9, 1, and 5. It, it's an encouragement to know that there is you're not alone. You must come to the conclusion that God has supernaturally knit you together and that you're not alone. As a matter of fact, you that are joined to the Lord are one spirit with him. You're never alone. Being alone is an impossibility. It requires deception to be alone. Think about it. You think you're alone. You feel sorry for yourself. You feel all isolated. You allow that to happen because God said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So who left? Who left you alone? You did, and you bought into something. And that spiritual connection needs to be broken. We need to pray that even right now before we go any further. If, I, if, I've, broke, if I've walked into, uh, accidentally or on purpose, I've entered into some kind of a loneliness, alone, isolation, uh, and even tried to put a religious uh, name tag on it, like, oh, I just got to be alone and pray and stay away from people for a long time. <laughs> uh, that's deception. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I just break that lie. We bring it to the light. We take the darkness and we bring it to the light. And we are interceding together for people that are isolated, alone, hopeless, and that's despair. That isolation is done. And we say, draw them with cords of love right now. And let's, uh, like that pastor friend of mine, let's release loving intercession to them right now, wherever they're at. And that loving intercession, may they feel our prayers in the midst of their so-called loneliness or isolation. Let them feel that there is love going toward them and know you are not alone. And if you've got Jesus in you, he hasn't gone anywhere. He's the hope of glory on the inside of you. Return to him and he will return to you. Receive forgiveness for having, having ignored him and operating in an independent self apart from his love and devotion. Now, the definition of a relationship, of a true spiritual connection, is the mutual sharing of life. Uh, I remember when I would tell Jennifer, uh, oh, we have so-and-so in the church, and I, I see a lot of potential in them, but it's a one-way relationship. She says, even if you tell them it's a one-way relationship, they don't understand what a one-way relationship is. What do you mean, Dennis, by a two-way relationship? A two-way relationship means a mutual sharing. I've had people come to the church from time to time, and they thought that uh, my job was just to pour into them, and there was no responsibility on their part whatsoever. Just receive, receive, receive. There's, there's consumers and there's contributors. Only contributors are actually entering into a mutuality of a relationship. It's not a one-way relationship. As a matter of fact, uh, when we first got married, Jennifer had a, a, a thing about not talking because she was put down uh, most of her life verbally. And she just figured, you know, it's better not to talk. And we were newlyweds, and she was telling me days later that it hurt, something hurt her feelings. And I'm going, and you didn't tell me. Well, I'm used to just keeping it to myself. That is not a relationship. Well, we might not like to hear the truth, right? The truth can be uh, <coughs> quite unnerving. <laughs> but at the same time, it's not a relationship if it's not two-way communication. So, 
What are the characteristics of this mutual sharing? One, it's mutual. The contribution does not have to be exactly the same, but it needs to be like a boss and employee, a teacher and a student, a pastor and his people, a mother and a child. You know, uh, it doesn't have to be, when I say mutuality, it doesn't have to be the same. Because right now there's even an era where the kids are the parent. No, the kids are not the parent. Some parent has to become the parent. <laughs> Somebody's got to be the adult. That is not mutuality. That's irresponsible. So uh, the contributions are not the same, but it's a contribution nonetheless. Both parties must accept an obligation to maintain the relationship and restore it if it breaks down. If it breaks down, there's a restoration. The second thing, or characteristic besides mutuality, is a shared life. Two people can perform the same action, but one has life and the other doesn't. Life requires a sharing of that life. We are embodiment spirit. We are an incarnate spirit. Our core is spirit. The body without the spirit is dead because we are spirit. Uh, there's a lot to be said about being equally yoked. And uh, now we know the scripture says if uh, a believer lives on an unbeliever, if the unbeliever depart, let them. But if they don't, then you have an opportunity to win them. So, uh, again, the mutuality has distinctions as far as what is measured out in the relationship. But love should surpass all. The motive, the source. Um, when you interact with someone and there's a wall between you, you feel uneasy, detached, bored, drained. Your spirit, it sounds kind of spooky, but this is really what's happening as a believer. And talking about spirit connections, your spirit is reaching out to touch them and it can't. It feels a wall. And even at the lowest common denominator, I could take any young Christian and say, did you ever tell somebody about Jesus and you feel like a vacuum cleaner was pulling the words out of your mouth like they were, <laughs> they were sucking it in? That's because there was no wall. Did you ever tell somebody about Jesus and you felt like, boy, am I going to get it now? They're going to slap me back hard. <laughs> huh? That's a wall. Your job you may discern a wall in someone else, but you can't make it come down. All you can do is be responsible that you have no wall and that I release. Now, that doesn't mean you don't set boundaries, and that's a whole other subject. There's times when you establish boundaries. But the only legitimate wall is peace. Peace in your heart. It will guard your heart and your mind. So um, your spirit's reaching out, but it's foiled. It can't touch them. Others it can touch very easily, very readily. Sharing life involves interaction. Now, by the way, when I say reaching out to touch somebody doesn't mean an unhealthy vulnerability to where you open to people. No, you open to God between people. And when peace guards your heart and your mind, you're in a place of safety to where God is always between you and people. And there is an anointing that flows then because there's an openness because God flows through that peace. peace. Peace will guard your heart from taking anything bad in, but peace in your heart will receive the anointing from someone else. Receptivity. When people pray for you, if, if, if you've got a wall up and somebody's praying for you, there's really nothing happening. <laughs> but if you've got to open to God, peace will guard your heart from anything unnecessary, and you drink in the anointing. Now, uh, some people do it readily, and their relationships always have life. Others do it poorly, and they have shallow relationships. Still, others don't know how to do it at all, <laughs> so we're trying to help you with that, that learn how to function more effectively from the Spirit. And another thing to take into account, it's not a matter of temperament. Uh, it's not about being an extrovert or an introvert. 
It's an extrovert can perish with inner loneliness. <laughs> They can look like they're the talker, they're the life of the party, and, and they could be suffering more from inner loneliness than the quiet person. Uh, the introvert might be quiet, but people want to be with them because they can touch the life that is around them. I, I still think, uh, <laughs> I haven't anybody said it lately, but I can still remember as a young pastor, one of my best compliments was a young girl, she had suffered with a lot of anxiety and she was working on her issues and everything. But one time after church, I'm standing by the back door and she stands next to me. She said, Pastor, you might, if I just stand here for a little while, you don't have to say anything, but I feel your peace and it really calms me. And I said, well, that's a compliment because you're, what it's saying is that you're exuding or you can fool people with your words, you can fool them with your gestures, but you can't hide what's emanating. And then there's some people, you feel their spirit and you go, I don't want to be around them. Hmm? Come on, you know what I'm talking about. You've, you've seen there, you've been there, done that. Because they've got their walls or there's a hostility. Hostility feels like a wind. Uh, you can walk into a room and a person that's angry, there's like a wind comes in and it makes you go like this. <laughs> You may not do that physically, but that's what you feel like doing. Like, eh. like I was going to say something, but I am not going to. You, are, you can be responding to that wind that they're carrying with you. So remember, just don't get caught up on uh, temperament or extrovert, introvert. No, it's character. It's relationship. It's Jesus. And there's, like I said, there's quiet people that you could just stand around them. There's loud people that you could just stand around and be there. It's a question of not their words or their gestures or their temperament. It's what they emanate that makes all the difference. So, John 15, verse 26. But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who proceeds from the Father, He's going to testify about me. This is a third indication, characteristic, attribute. And that is, and this sounds almost spooky, but it's like a relationship is a separate reality. It's a separate entity. Uh, a relationship in its own right quite apart from the persons who make it up. <laughs> so in other words, Jennifer's her own person, created in the image of God with a purpose. She didn't lose any of her uniqueness or her personal identity. I'm Dennis. I'm unique. I'm a one of a kind. And some people out there say, good. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm a one of a kind, there never was another me, never will be another me, but we're married, and in that marriage there is a relationship that's a separate entity. Interesting, when people go for counseling, too often they spend too much time trying to change the entity. When you want to change that entity uh, called a relationship, the people need to change. We want to change the marriage entity or what that relationship looks like, that spiritual connection, it's a separate reality, but the only way that you form or fashion that reality is Jennifer would have to change and I would have to change to change that reality. I've seen people go for marriage counseling and they want to work on the marriage. Well, I can't work on the marriage. I have to work on her or him. <laughs> I can't work on this over here. It's a separate entity, but it's a product of your relationship. Now, God says, in a marriage, the husband and wife are two entities. The third entity is the husband-wife relationship. Now, a relationship is a reality in its own right. Now, think about it. Um, a, a, a woman with child, before that baby's born, there's, there's a relationship. It's like the mother knows there's a child, there's another person in their womb. 
and it's a relationship in its own right. And it should be producing something. As a matter of fact, physically it releases oxytocin and it releases uh, even physically things to contribute to that relationship. You think God doesn't have an ability to contribute to our relationships if we would let him? Instead of just writing people off or instead of just uh, complaining about it and never doing anything internally about it. So... This, this is why it is so important to work on our relationship rather than to keep trying to change the other person. <laughs> That's a, trying to change the other person is the fool's mistake. Now, our relationship with God. Uh, we've all said so far applies to our relationship with God. As you relate to people, you relate to God. You relate to God, you relate to people. Uh, it requires an investment of ourselves. That's a good question everybody's saying. To what degree do I invest in the relationship? A relationship God requires an investment in ourselves. Bible study, prayer, putting yourself into human relationship requires touching another human being, spirit to spirit. How do we do it? By giving ourselves wholeheartedly to God, by reaching out with our spirit consciously, Letting love flow. Just like that pastor praying for her husband in Africa. Distance doesn't matter. And you don't even have to have a lot of specificity. All she did was, I'm in relationship with my husband and I'm releasing love there to while he's in Africa. And he felt it. That's a spiritual connection that we all need. We need to be able to feel the prayers of one another. We need to feel the love of, of one another toward people. We need to feel walls come down. You know, I've had a lot of people in my life where I could feel the walls, but I also felt the walls come down, and that just touches my heart like nothing else can. Because what it's saying is I want the relationship enough to deal with my stuff. Isn't that investing in the relationship? That's the amazing thing that God does. Now, uh, He gives you His 100% completely focused on you, and the revelation for me was undivided attention. Uh, I'm sitting there thinking, I've never had a friend so close that undivided attention means he was thinking about me even when I was sleeping. All it did is it stirred up a hunger and a thirst to reciprocate. Don't you want to reciprocate? Somebody loves you that much. I can't stop thinking about you. My thoughts are more numerous towards you than the grains of the sands of the sea. Come on, if that doesn't pluck a little heartstring, what will? I love you so much that I never sleep, that even while you're sleeping, my thoughts are going towards you, and I'm bathing you. And then morning by morning, I'm going to awaken your ear to hear what I have to say to you. Longing that kind of a relationship? <laughs> wow. God is giving us that undivided attention. You know, in the Amplified Bible, you know, we know, we know um, most of says, Jesus says, I will send the comforter to you. I will send uh, the helper. Uh, I loved walking in the relationship of, in the Amplified Bible, at least seven of them, seven characteristics of him. And I so enjoyed in my interaction with God working with him in those various relationships. Uh, the first one was, I am your teacher. And so I would walk with the Holy Spirit and Jesus in me as my teacher. And the scripture says, you, do, you don't have need to anyone teach you. The Holy Spirit wants to teach you. you. We still need teachers that can hear from God, but it's, there's a teacher in you that wants to teach you. Are you willing to learn? Or do you, I already know that. I already know that. I got that first. I used to get people, when it came to Revelation, if I said anything, you know, here, God's showing me this. I already had that. I already had that. Okay. All right. I think you need to uh, be the student for a little bit longer and let him be the teacher. And then, along with being a teacher, he's my helper. And it was like a helper. He actually gives me the grace to be and to do. The Holy Spirit is my helper. 
and he's an intercessor. God is actually praying for me. He wants the best for me. Remember, Jesus told Peter, I prayed for you that your faith would not fail you. Ah, that's wonderful. He invested himself in prayer for me. So he's my teacher. He's a helper. And then walk with him. You know, I want to challenge some of you. Walk with him in those relationships. Take your time. Don't just say it out loud. But walk with him and know that you know that you know that when you're on the road and you're in the car alone, that he is your helper. And he's also your teacher. He'd like to teach you something while you're on the road. He does me all the time. <laughs> I thought everybody needed to go to Dennis Clark's school of driving, but God was saying, I'm, I'm actually, uh, you're a student driver, and I'm the boss, and I would like to teach you a few things on the road. I'm your teacher, I'm your helper, I'm your intercessor, and I'm praying for you. I, I want you to win. Doesn't love want you to win? Love, uh, love rejoices when truth wins out. So your teacher, your helper, your intercessor, all of that's in there. <laughs> He's your advocate, too. Huh, with the way attorney fees are now, I like having uh, someone on <clears throat> retainer. I've got Jesus on retainer because it says he's my advocate. How does that sound? Wouldn't you like to have that? He's pro bono, okay? <laughs> he's for you. He's an advocate. He's your advocate. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then when you're in that place where... You need to just wait upon him. He becomes your counselor. And if you take his counsel, if you obey his counsel, the fruit is comfort. You actually enter into the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And it, you need to know that experientially because the day is going to come when the scripture is going to say to you, comfort others with the same comfort whereby you are comforted. If you're in disarray and you don't even understand comfort, you're of no value relationally to give comfort to anybody else. You can't give something you don't have. And lastly, the standby. It wasn't long ago I, w I was weeping, just walking down the hallway, thinking in terms of the standby as being my friend. Jesus, my friend. I'm going, hey, I've had friends come and go, and so have you. Think about it. There's childhood friends that you don't know. There's some friends that went to be with the Lord. There's friends that, you, that are no longer friends. Some even became enemies in a sense. But in all reality, he never leaves you or forsakes you. And he was steadfast, and he was your paraclete. He was your standby. And I was walking in the hall and just weeping. I've never known that level of friendship. I've known some pretty good friendships. But I've never known anything like that. And I can recall different things that friends have said to me that kind of showed me that they invested in my relationship as I was investing in theirs. And I'll just close with the one example when God was teaching me this. God says, I want you to submit to this pastor of a thousand member church. He don't know you from Adam, but I want you to just carry block for the building of his church. And I did. I just did general labor to honor the man without knowing. And later, that was the very man out of thousands of people who said, Dennis, I want to, I want to ordain you and see that you're preaching the gospel of Jesus. I, wanna, I like you. Don't you want to hear that? Open your heart to a relationship in the days ahead. And fear not. Amen. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.